So this is the marina part, not the Connor part. So um, I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about major trauma audit and the National Office of Clinical Audit. And it works. So who is the National Office of Clinical Audit? Well, we were established in 2012 to create sustainable audit programmes to the health service. And you can see here we have a, broad, we have a portfolio of national clinical audit. We work to a governance board. But I'm here today to talk to you about the major trauma audit. We have a really good website with lots of detail on all of these really good audits. Please visit it. What is major trauma audit? Well, major trauma audit collects information on patients who, on people who become injured, the injuries they sustain, how people, how they are come into our hospital systems, and the care they receive in our hospital systems. As you can understand, this information is very, very useful to our hospitals as they can begin to review their own data and information. They can identify both good outcomes and deficits in care, and then most importantly, learn from both. And that is the circle of audit. We were delighted when Major Trauma Audit came into the National Office of Clinical Audit in um, 2013. But it didn't start with us. And I think Dr. Thor earlier this morning talked about clinical champions. Well, the road to Major Trauma Audit, audit has been paved with clinical champions. Back in 2003, um, our Dr. Chris Luke and his colleagues in the Royal College of Surgeons um, wrote a guideline on initial treatment of severely injured patients. They identified the importance of trauma, trauma audit. This was followed up by the Phillips Report in 2008 on severe traumatic brain injury, and again endorsed the need for a national major trauma audit. And the, again, in 2009, uh, Dr. Patricia Houlihan and colleagues, again in the Royal College of Surgeons, set, set up the first business case for a trauma audit. And the, this was endorsed by the Emergency Medicine Programme in their model of care in 2012, the need again for, another, uh, for a trauma audit. And in 2013, and um, with the support of the HSE Quality Improvement Division, funding was achieved for major trauma audit in the National Office of Clinical Audit. And in fact, back in 2008, some of our hospitals had already begun to work with TARN because TARN had been identified as a, a leader in trauma audit um, and somebody where we could um, link to lo almost locally, but um, so, uh, just across the waters. So we worked with TARN um, to implement trauma audit from 2013. And that journey has continued, and here we are today, launching a tra major trauma audit as the first national clinical audit under the auspices of the NCEC. So I want to just take you on that journey, share our, less our, share our reflections with you. Firstly, I just want to introduce you to our colleagues and our, introduce you to our colleagues in Tarn. I suppose Tarn, were, uh, Tarn have been established in 1990, and they have a long history of, of trauma audit. They're clinically led, they're academic, and they're independent, and they work to establish clinical guidelines. They are self-funded through licensing fees, and NOCA pays the licensing fees for our 26 participating hospitals. They, are, they collect data from not just England and Ireland, but also from Denmark and Switzerland. And in 2013, we first met with Marilyn and Laura, um, our colleagues in Tarn. We agreed a data set for our Irish register. But really, we, what we did at that time is we absolutely took the Tarn data set as it was and made some amendments to contextualize it in an Irish setting. We established a licensing, plan, uh, a licensing for hospitals, we agreed that, and we established a training plan for training our, our, our um, people in hospitals, training people in hospitals to collect the data and then to review the data. And TARN have been hugely supportive of us on this journey, coming up in the dead of winter to come and, mo and um, to come to our meetings and support us and um, providing information to us and um, and, and supporting us on this journey. To start off, and, and I think again something that Dr. Torres said this morning, you know, you know, you've got to know what you want to do. 
and we set clear, and when we started our journey, we set clear objectives to, for our major trauma audit. And I suppose it was to establish a baseline of trauma practice, to map um, and potentially improve current care pathways, to promote reflective clinical practice at a local level and also at national level, and finally to provide high quality data to enable peer-reviewed research and drive clinical changes. So we had four clear objectives when we started this journey, and I think these are absolutely critical um, for, in order to assess how your, your audit is doing. And I say these drove us um, to success. Like all good projects, you need a plan. We, had, we, develop, we developed a plan which covered our background, included our, our aims and objectives, and set out how we were going to um, operationally implement major trauma audit, and also set out how we would and what information we would um, make available around that. We also, information for our audit users and information for the public and our patients in our hospitals. Like, like um, I think the legend says there are 365 islands in Clue Bay. Um, there are a large number of stakeholders um, for, for trauma audit. I, I suppose a patient who experiences trauma will have a, a, lot, a number of touch points in the healthcare system, in the pre-hospital or in the pre-hospital the pre-hospital services. When you come into hospital, your emergency department, your radiology, and all your support services, your laboratory services, whether the patient goes to intensive care or goes to a ward or surgery, an awful lot of stakeholders involved in trauma, in the care of trauma patients. Um, as well as patients themselves, and also very often um, post-hospital services and rehab. So I suppose identifying these stakeholders, reaching out to them, and these people became the basis of our major trauma audit governance committee. The role of this committee was to provide oversight to the implementation, but also oversee the outputs of our audit. Um, and these and, and these stakeholders are all part of our Trauma Audit Governance Committee. It was also important to identify a clinical lead, and clinical leadership is hugely important, as Dr. Thor said this morning, um, in terms of um, providing, in, in terms of implementation of, of national clinical audit. Um, I think as well, it also supports engagement when, um, because if, um, once hospitals can see clear leadership um, and once clinicians can see clean, clear leadership, they're more likely to engage with the audit. And we had Dr. Connor DC, who's my work husband. <laughs> For an, so how did we go about implementing major trauma audit? You know, we started in 2013. We actually did road trips. We went to the hospitals. And I think that was hugely important, doing those face-to-face -face meetings with the hospital executives, the hospital clinicians, to tell them you know, what we were about to do. Now, don't forget clinicians were, had been calling for this audit for quite a while, so they were bought into this. But having clinicians there with the hospital executive buying into this was hugely powerful. We asked the hospitals at that time to identify a clinical need a major trauma coordinator, somebody to collect the data, um, bring the data, collate it, bring it together, submit it to TARN and review, and, and bring together outputs. And working with a clinical lead, also a local governance structure to review the outputs of that ma of major trauma audit, because this is critical to a hospital using its data and learning from it. So that's, that's what we ask the hospitals to do. Where are we now? We now have 26 hospitals participating in this audit. Those hospitals are receiving their reports and their dashboards. They're reviewing that and learning from it. Hospitals are making their own improvements. Hospitals are implementing ED sepsis pathways. Hospitals are changing documentation to improve data collection. So making their own local improvements. And major trauma audit has matured with, the, with, our, with our office maturing. So going back to, unless you know what you want to do, you can't see if, you, if you've been successful. Well, this is, a, this is what major trauma audit has achieved to date. We're meeting our first three objectives. And we now have a data set 
we had, I think, of over 10,000 approved submissions. So we're building a high quality data set to facilitate research for trauma in Ireland. And I'm very proud, and I think we all should be very proud of that. So that was part of our journey. And at the beginning then of 2016, the NOCA board endorsed that major trauma audit should seek NCC um, endorsement. And that's exactly what we did. We sought prioritization um, we, um, and then quality assurance. And we were successful in achieving that in October this year. As somebody said to me once, if, it, if it's worth doing, there will be work involved. And it has been, it has, been, it has bought a, a lot of work, it, but it, it certainly what we believe this brings to major trauma audit is it highlights that the health service has prioritised major trauma audit and trauma care. Our hospitals will then see how important this audit is and to our patients as well, to, and our health service has endorsed this audit. Because major trauma audit provides a dashboard for trauma care. So we are now focusing on trauma right across the system. So I think this is hugely important for trauma audit and for trauma care. With that, and, it is and strategically linked to that, we are also um, publishing our first national report today. And you will find that on our website, www noca.ie forward slash publications but there will be um, can I direct you to our stand and there will be reports available at the NOCA stand here after this presentation oh god I keep doing that it's too, I have too many props I suppose um, the most important thing and, and what I'm really delighted to be able to do here today is to thank people who paved this journey for us. All the people that came before us I've already mentioned, but the people who supported on, us in NOCA on this journey from 2013 to date, um, and I don't expect you to read all of these names from here, but these are major trauma aud audit governance committee and all of those stakeholders um, that, that, that I've mentioned al already. And some of, um, some of those who are already here, to, um, here today, and I know Irina was here, um, yeah, and supported us on, on, the, on this journey. But equally and, equally and even more importantly, this isn't our work. This is the work of our Irish hospitals carrying this work out. And here are the names of some of the clinical leads and data coordinators who have made this possible. And they then are supporting the work of our frontline staff. So this is what, this is what we need to be so very proud of today these people. Thank you very much. I was delighted for this opportunity to present this to you today. Uh, thanks, Marina. Um, so, um, you were expecting me to come up and talk straight away about data. And data is very important, but so too are patient stories. And I've had to travel away to come up uh, to, to, to bring this story to you. This is the story of Tamara Coakley. Tamara was a patient I met back in 2011 when I was an emergency medicine consultant working at the Alfred Trauma Centre. Tamara was a horse trainer, is still a horse trainer, and she and her sister were coming back from a horse event with a horse box on the back and the two kids in the back seat and they hit a lorry. And uh, Tamara's nephew, he was seven, uh, Kayan was his name, he died at the scene. And Tamara was trapped for two hours in that car as they tried to extricate her before helicoptering her into the trauma team at the Alfred that I was part of. To say that she was circling the drain when she arrived with a blood pressure of 60 on 30, oxygen sats of 79% is not being dramatic. Those of you who are clinical in the audience will recognize how injured she was. She had a right-sided tension pneumothorax, a left hemothorax, a grade four splenic laceration, uh, bleeding in her gut, okay. Her humerus was fractured. She had an open femur fracture. She had a spinal unstable fracture. She had multiple other spinous process and transverse process fractures and she had facial fractures and multiple rib fractures, and more importantly, she bled down to a haemoglobin of 3.6 on a background of being Jehovah's Witness. That's a tough night at the office. 
Now, what those, without her being a Jehovah's Witness, trauma audit will tell us that her probability of survival is 30%. That's if she wasn't a Jehovah's Witness. Okay, her probability, so the likelihood of her surviving, she will be an unexpected survivor, okay? And for her to survive, what she needed was the right people in the right place with the right expertise and for her to get there in the right time. She needed somebody to decompress her ten tension pneumothorax. She needed that blood that was sitting in her left hemithorax to be recirculated into her system by self, cell salvage technologies that requires technicians that are available to do that. She needed to have intensivists available so that she could be managed to minimize her oxygen requirements because her oxygen carrying capacity was so reduced with her low hemoglobin. She needed hematologists to deal with her coagulopathy so that she would survive and they would give her medications that would enhance, enhance her red cell generating capacity. She survived. And she survived because all those complex links in that chain of survival were working at their best. Trauma audit can be used to see where we are at now in the Irish context. So it can inform how trauma networks will develop. And then if changes are made such that trauma networks are developed in Ireland, we can monitor the effect of those changes. As Ed Edwards Deming said, you can't manage what you don't measure. We're challenged in Ireland at the moment in how the trauma system is set up. If I go out of here today and I get hit by a bus, I'll be brought to St. James's Hospital. I'll be, they'll attempt to resuscitate me. If there's a splenic injury, they might bring me to theatre or embolise it. But if I have a head injury, I need to be transferred to Beaumont. And if I have a spinal injury, I need to be transferred to the Mater Hospital. And if I have a pelvic injury, and I could have all of these injuries all, at, all in, one, in, in one accident. I then need to go to Tala for my pelvic injury. So there are challenges associated with delivering that care in that sort of a system. And there are challenges associated with monitoring that care in that sort of a system. And that's why major trauma audit in the Irish context has been challenging to get going. But now that we have it going is a huge monument, monumental milestone achievement. And I'm honoured to have been part of it. So to give context on what patients that we are talking about, it's not trivial trauma. This is not isolated. Uh, these are not isolated injuries. These are patients who spend three days or more in our hospitals that are, in, that are brought into ICU or transferred out of our hospital or into our hospitals for ongoing care. There are patients who have a high cost to the health system, but they are patients who are sustained either life-threatening or life-changing injury. That's the nature of the trauma that we are dealing with in, in NOCA in our trauma audit. And we collect pieces of information from across that patient pathway, from pre-hospital, how long it took them to get to hospital, what their initial observations were, what medications they received pre-hospital, who led the trauma team, was there a trauma team at the emergency department, how quickly did they get into the CT scanner, how quickly did they get to theatre, what was done in theatre, how long did they spend in hospital, how long did they spend in ICU. We now have all those metrics in a very robust methodology. So, in terms of results then, when we look at 2014 and 2015, and we, we appreciate from Marina's talk how this was set up, this was set up with the goodwill of the CEOs designating a major trauma audit data collector or data coordinator to be designated to major trauma audit. And across the hospitals, they came on in a staggered way. And at various times, there were uh, those, those trauma uh, collectors, those trauma data coordinators were re-designated to other tasks. And we worked with that, and they worked with us. And, but that does explain why, over the two years, we've got 61% data completeness as opposed to 95 98%, which is where we would like to be in the context of mandatory audit. But of the data that we have, the data quality is excellent. It's 95% data completeness. So we can have a lot of confidence in the data that we have collected. And what we also see is that we have data across 6,000 patients. That's a lot of patient interactions. And these, as I said, are the pointy end of trauma. So there are huge, uh, there's huge information that we can gain from this data. 
that can be used to improve trauma care in Ireland. And we wanted to do that. We wanted to quality assure patient care, trauma patient care, so that patients can be reassured that their care has been monitored closely. We also fundamentally wanted to improve trauma care in Ireland and drive a quality improvement agenda. So within that context, the major trauma audit data coordinator is fundamental and it's really important that they are appreciated as being absolutely fundamental in terms of uh, a patient, the trauma patient's advocate. When we look at the demographics, there are also lessons to be learned. We can see that trauma isn't just a disease of the 20-year-old who goes out and gets drunk and has lots of Red Bull and drives his car really fast and hits a, a telephone pole. It's not that at all, in fact. Or 40% of major trauma nowadays is in the older age group, 65 year olds and older. 54% of major trauma is in uh, potential taxpayers. Our ministers need to realize that. 54% are in that age group from 16 to 65. Knowing exactly the dem demographics, however, helps us in terms of predicting what the treatment requirements will be and what the preventative strategies should be to avoid these events happening in the first instance. So we look at cause of injury, and many of us would have thought of Tamara as being a relatively common cause of major trauma, hitting a car, hitting a lorry, and so on. But in actual fact, low falls of less than two meters are what we most frequently see as the cause of major trauma, followed by road traffic, road trauma. What we see at the lower end, but at the more lethal end then, is asphyxia and drowning. So that is essentially where you see the interaction of social care, psychological and psychiatric services interacting with the trauma services, because asphyxiation represents those that come to the hospital having hung themselves largely. Okay? Uh, they survive to get to hospital, but they, they more, more of our deaths in this trauma registry are those patients than any other group. So what are the injuries and what, uh, that constitute major trauma? Well, 23% of them are major head injuries or severe head injuries, 11% are spinal injuries, and 35% are multiple injuries. 30% of patients need to be transferred on from their initial hospital to another hospital for definitive care. Head injuries are a particular group that we should be cognizant of. It is a catastrophic, devastating injury for the patient and their family. Within a moment, their life completely changes. And international best practice would say that people with a head injury, with a Glasgow coma score, which is a coma level of eight or less, that means they're deeply unconscious, should be treated in a specialist uh, by, a, by uh, they, they should be, uh, have access to specialist treatment, neurosurgeons. Okay? What we see in the Irish context over 2014 and 2015 is that 40% of severely head injured patients in Ireland are treated by neurosurgeons. This compares in the UK, in the UK that, that, that number is 15%. Okay? So immediately you can see how major trauma audit can identify where focus of attention can be placed. Those of us who thought that major trauma would involve a nine to five office job are mistaken. Okay, most of this work happens outside of nine to five. Okay, 58% happens between 4 p.m. and 8 a.m. And so that has ramifications uh, in how we develop our trauma systems, our trauma teams, how we make sure that the hospitals are prepared for the Tamara who is brought to their emergency department front door. Trauma teams are associated with improved access to critical interventions and improved outcomes. However, they haven't received traction in the Irish context. And part of that is because we are spreading our doctors across 26 receiving trauma uh, facilities. Okay? And it, the challenges of the EWTD, EU Working Time Directive, are being seen in terms of the availability of trauma teams so that that patient, when they arrive at that hospital, has the right expertise immediately available so that critical decisions can be, can be made and expedited. And of those trauma teams, the number that are led by a consultant is also worryingly low in terms of what we're capturing. Okay? Now, part of this we acknowledge is that the, the culture around uh, audit 
may mean that because it's new and, and, and embryonic, that doctors aren't writing if they're the consultant and what time they saw the patient and so on. They're often coming in supervising work as opposed to documenting the work that they're supervising. But nonetheless, it is a signal that we need to pay attention to. We can use major trauma audit uh, to predict what the ICU bed capacity for trauma should be, what ICU capacity is required, and we can look at it across the country and see where the ICU capacity is required. We can look at length of stay. We know that the ICU length of stay for trauma, the median ICU length of stay is two to three days, and the hospital length of stay then for major trauma is seven days, median. And this is, this is what we're interested in really, is outcomes. But outcomes of themselves, binary, lived or died, do not give us enough information, okay? What we're really interested in is the unexpected outcomes. Patients who should have survived that didn't, or patients that survived who weren't expected to survive. And what we want is that they're risk adjusted. Because an 85 year old that gets stabbed on Grafton Street is very different to a 20-year-old who gets stabbed in Grafton Street. Their comorbidities comorbi and their associated illnesses are very different. So we need to risk adjust for that. But when you look at the mortality and look at the, those that died across age groups, there are some interesting findings. So in terms of our pediatric age group, less than 16-year-olds, we had 16 who died that were captured on the data set. 75% were male, okay? The median age is 11. Okay, it's not the one to two year olds, it's the 11 year olds who are presumably at, at risk activities. And we see that 50% of them were deaths due to either asphyxia, which is hanging, okay, or drowning. Okay? And their median injury severity score, which is the level of injury that they sustained is 25. When we look at the working age group, then we see more males in that age group. And again, here we see the interdigitation between social care, psychological, psychiatric services and major trauma because 28% of these are asphyxia and drowning, a significant proportion of which would have been deliberate. And then you go to the older age group and you see a balancing up of the male-female distribution. More, a greater proportion of this age group are people who have falls less than two meters. So the elderly patient who falls over, snaps their wrist, fractures their pelvis, sustains a head injury, initially brought to their local emergency department, and the level of injury not necessarily appreciated immediately uh, because of the relatively innocuous nature of how it happened. But they are, by far and away, a significant uh, burden uh, of work that require a different approach to that 20-year-old. The WS score is something that gives us very meaningful information in that what it looks at is the probability of survival for each individual patient, but it contextualizes it then to all patients. So what we know is that in Ireland, the WS score for the whole country is 1.7, which means that for every 100 patients that present to Irish hospitals with major trauma, there are 1.7 excess survivors or extra survivors. It's good that that's not a negative number, okay? That would mean that there's one, if it was minus 1.7, then there would be 1.7 excess deaths, okay? And we can see that the confidence interval is positive, but there's a warning here, and the warning is that we only have data on 61% of patients, and it might well be that when we come back next year and fill in the missing data uh, with the extra 39% of patients that aren't captured, that that WS score might change. It might not, but it might. So we're not going to crack open the champagne just yet in terms of uh, Irish uh, major trauma performance. What we do see though, and what ha hospitals have now access to, is their metrics compared to the other hospitals in Ireland. So each hospital knows what its WS score is, and they get to look at their peer hospitals and see what their WS score is. And that creation of competition between hospitals is fundamental in driving quality improvement in the system across hospitals. What we see is that there's variation from minus 2.4, that would be excess deaths, uh, to plus 3.9, which is excess survivors. But again, no need to get alarmed about this because these numbers are still small at this stage and they don't reach, reach statistical significance yet. But it's a space to watch. 
Mortality is a crude outcome measure. Survival is a crude outcome measure for quality. What, the space that we want to get into in major trauma audit is the functional outcomes and the quality of life outcomes for these patients. Because as you see, only 5% of the overall group die, but a lot of them have life-altering uh, uh, injuries that might not have been so life-altering uh, had the treatment processes been different. We don't know. We need to look at that. And the way we look at that is by monitoring functional and quality of life outcomes. So the key take home messages are that we now have, for the first time in Ireland, a robust data set. We should and are using it as a quality assurance and quality improvement tool. We think that we have contributed a lot to the Irish audit culture in hospitals because, as Marina said, before hospitals were licensed uh, for major trauma audit, they had to show that they had a trauma audit governance group in place in their hospital that would oversee the implementation of the audit and the output from the audit. And that governance group would be comprised of uh, stakeholders in trauma care in that hospital. The audit can be used to monitor equity of access to care. So the politician up in Letterkenny that's worried about his traumas, he can look and see what the trauma outcomes are for his population just in the same way as the politician looking after those patients in Donnybrook. The audit points to trauma teams and the fact that it hasn't gained traction in Ireland. And we would suggest that at a national level, guidelines need to be produced to improve this for Irish hospitals. We've pointed to the fact that we think that functional and quality life outcomes are important. And we think that major trauma audit should be a fundamental, it should be a keystone in the development of trauma networks in Ireland because it can tell us where we are and tell us the effect that the interventions that we're making are having. So I want to th thank my work wife, Marina, <laughs> and all those that I've had the honour and privilege to work with across data collectors, data coordinators, trauma leads, trauma stakeholders, patients, uh, who've made this this, this milestone day possible. And again, just to thank those folks that drove up from all parts of the country at all times of the year to attend uh, trauma governance group meetings at RCSI. This document is, and this process would not have the power it has were it not for their involvement too. Thank you. So thank you very much to Connor and Marina for those excellent presentations. Um, and I think it just demonstrates the huge amount of work that's been involved and, and behind this, the years of work. So well done to all. Um, we have some time for questions, so I'll open it to the floor. There are mobile microphones. And just perhaps while people are getting their mics, if I could put it, and maybe Marina would like to join uh, Connor up, up here on the couch. I suppose if we put it to both of you, if you roll on the clock five years, um, how do you think this audit will change practices in Ireland? And then secondly, maybe, how will you increase that um, data completeness up towards the 90s? What strategies might you have? So, yeah. so there are two questions that struck me during the presentation. Thank you. So I guess in terms of the data completeness piece first, uh, becoming NCEC accredited has been really important to us in terms of uh, legitimizing the process in terms of driving it and, and uh, the, the, the fact that the NCC has gone through its processes and approved it means an awful lot in terms of where it stands in priorities within hospitals. And so we feel that that will help uh, prioritize the role of the trauma data coordinator at the hospitals. We hope it will. In terms of where this is going to go, uh, up until now, we were driven by anecdote. I mean, the point has been made earlier on. We were driven by anecdote and by people's dominions and by people's desire to have things set up in the, th the way that they thought was correct. However, the data wasn't there to show whether it was or it wasn't, to refute uh, their arguments or not, or to agree with their arguments. Now we're going to have irrefutable data that will show where our hospitals are in terms of performance. And it's not going to be possible to continue uh, to work in absence of data. So data is going to drive the development of trauma networks. It has to drive the, de the development of trauma networks. In 2012, they reconfigured trauma networks in the UK. They have seen 
remarkable improvements in survival associated with the reconfiguration of trauma networks. We hope that we're well positioned now, that we've got a, a data set that provides baseline data and that any changes that will come uh, in association with trauma network reconfiguration, which is inevitable based on the success story that it has been in the UK, you can't, con you can't ignore the improvements in survival that have been seen in the UK. Um, that, that we now are strategically uh, very well able to see what impact um, the network changes are going to have. Great. Karina, would you like to add something yeah, to I this? have two things. One, um, and Connor mentioned it already, I suppose our, this, oh yeah, this audit currently takes us to discharge from the acute setting. Our next ambition is to look um, at the follow-up care of patients for functional and quality of life outcomes. So um, health services expect another um, business case on the way. Um, se secondly, um, I think our ambition is um, how will this change practice? We now have a data set where that can actually facilitate research in an Irish context. And I think that's what will lead to changes in practice. You know, encouraging, um, encouraging people to ask questions of that data set. So I think it's a very exciting place that, that we, we're, we're in right now. Great, thank you. Are there, is there any question there from the floor, just with the lights on? There's one, we'll take that. Oh, sorry, Dr. Houlihan. No. Do you want to come up here? It's a question for Connor, or maybe if, if our Tarn colleagues are still with us, uh, and you mentioned it in your presentation, the extent to which this kind of knowledge that we didn't have before, and to me what jumps out is not only the messages that you're giving us in relation to quality and the ability to be able to make those cross comparisons between centres and set up priorities around how we develop service and so on, but the, the priorities back the chain, if you like, in terms of prevention. Mm. And when you look at the profile demographically, yep. you look at the risks that apply to people who are having those kind of low height falls yep. and so yep. on and so forth. To what extent, like the kind of the, 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 the improvements that have been seen in the UK have been a combination of, uh, if you like, improvements in quality of care delivered to people who have suffered uh, uh, an impact or, or, or are, are delivered to the population through better preventive strategies or is there any evidence in relation to that? Maybe if you're in a position to, 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 to comment or maybe our colleagues from Tarn. Um, I'm not sure if our Thank you. Tarn colleagues want to uh, jump in here. I'll get started though. Um, it's hard. Um, like uh, improvements in outcomes in trauma care are multifactorial. So, there a, part of that story is the RSA's work in terms of promoting, um, you know, safe driving, safe road behaviour, safe road culture. Part of that story is the drink driving campaign and law enforcement and safety belts. Part of that story is bicycle helmets taking bicyclists off the main roads and putting them into segregated bicycle tracks and so on. It can be hard to capture it in trauma registries and so what you're looking at is comparing jurisdictions that have these rules with jurisdictions that don't and you now have a data set that allows you risk adjust for the variance across those jurisdictions uh, and limit that difference then to whether bicycle helmets are in place and look at bicycle injuries, uh, look at, you know, law enforcement around alcohol at one place versus another. And because we're part now of a benchmark system, TARN, we can do those sorts of studies. We weren't able to do that yeah, before. Yeah. It's an international yeah. benchmark that we can use as a comparator. We can also use and have we used, TARN has been used to compare UK trauma experience with that of Victoria so, uh, and, and other areas as well. So, uh, so there, there's, there's huge potential. Good. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, uh, all of those things that, that uh, Connor's just mentioned, but we're just starting some work now with the fire and rescue services um, to look at prevention in that context. Um, but that's work's only just starting, really. So the patients that go onto the database are patients that have been injured 
And the improvement in care is definitely because of health care, not because of prevention. Great. Well, I think we could keep talking here for a long time, but we have an, another presentation to discuss. So I think congratulations to everyone involved. You've set the very high standard. The bar is very high. And um, looking forward to many more national audits. So well done.